This episode is brought to you with support from PerfectDailyGrind.com. Perfect Daily Grind, your source for coffee education, articles, videos, and more, from the farm to the cup. Last episode, we left off with Heather Perry discussing the role of baristas in the world of low coffee prices. In this episode, we ask Heather, what do you suggest as some solutions to some of the challenges we face in the current price crisis? If we were to step out of the the barista world for a second, well, not fully step out because the SCA is always involved there with the barista. But, you know, the Coffee Price Crisis Response Initiative is something that was established by the SCA in 2018, and there were some goals that were set for 2019. I'm curious if there's new information from the research and the collaboration that's been done there, um, and is there anything you feel is critical for understanding and confronting the price issue for us to talk about on the show today? Unfortunately, I don't have anything on for that today. They have this year, so we had found Form to the Future, so we partnered with to help kind of do this work. And I, I think it's one of the great things that's come out of this is all of the partnerships that we've created with the SCA and kind of the organization of different organizations that we've been able to help accomplish to confront this. But at the same time, it, it's a big conversation. And, you know, they've got the end of this year to kind of look back, see what their research has created, see what kind of major recommendations they can make. Um, and so we aren't rushing that work. They, mm-hmm, you know, sure. they, they've still got a few months ahead of them of stuff to do. So we don't have any firm outputs yet on it. No, thank Yeah. Thanks for answering that, honestly. And, um, that, that's something we'll keep an eye on, obviously, as it seems like it may be a major player in solutions, um, in the near future, or at least understanding solutions to the problem and the crisis that we face today in coffee. For um, sure. yeah. So we sort of wrapped you know, wrapped up the conversation, gotten to the the end of, um, not the end of the conversation itself. Obviously, we you just said how complex the issue is, how big the conversation is, and that's why we have this entire series dedicated to hearing from different people in the industry, their perspective of the price crisis, and hopefully, with that, we can sort of absorb uh, the information and and maybe see some solutions. Is is the goal for us? at the coffee podcast, at least. I'm curious, this isn't on our agenda, but did you have anything you wanted to add to this particular conversation before I I jump into the closing questions? You know, the only thing that I would say is a way that roasters, buyers, whatever it may be, can have kind of an impact on on the specialty market is when you look at these places, you know, these producing countries in Central America that that the coffee prices is, is really having an impact at, Don't be afraid to find ways to use some of these more value coffees. You know, don't turn something down because it's an 82 point coffee. How could you utilize an 82 point coffee to purchase it? Because those are the coffees that are having the effect on the future, right? Everything that you're not buying doesn't mean that your your farmer's not producing it. It, They're still producing those coffees at those lower levels, at those lower scores. They're still producing some of those. How can we as an industry start to use some of those coffees in a more interesting way what can I think that's the real challenge for baristas and for roasters, right? Like, mm. how can we nuance these coffees? What can we do with them to make them interesting so that we're not leaving them behind to just be sold on the sea and they're just at the mercy of the market? Right. Like that to me would be a really big, interesting challenge for the for us on the consuming side to handle. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for it, but I think it's a really good challenge out there. You know, when you're at that cupping table, don't push down everything that's an eighty six or you know what I mean. Don't don't just do that because they still got they still have to sell those coffees. Yeah, and if they don't, they end up on the sea market, right? Well, if they yep. weren't already on the sea market, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. That conversation is actually, it's become one of my favorites, but uh, we're running out of time, but it's something to chew on for sure. So let's let's hop into the closing questions here. What can coffee shop businesses do to address this problem? And if you want, well, we kind of talked about it already, This the idea of the 82 coffee discussion or the 82 point coffee discussion. Is there anything else you think that coffee shop businesses can do, roasters can do, baristas can do to um, acknowledge the issue or even maybe some solutions that you might have in mind? 
solutions I don't necessarily have by any means, but I do sure. think finding ways to incorporate some of those more value copies is something that everybody can kind of do, you know, not just pick it, putting yourself in the 86 to 90 copies, but finding something else to do. I also think that there is, you know, ultimately we have to make this valuable to consumers, right? So I think mm-hmm. as an industry, like we have to, and this is, this is bigger than us, but, you know, if, if McDonald's is throwing around words like sustainability and, and, and it, we have to be really careful with our words because they just don't mean anything to consumers anymore. So how do we genuinely get hmm. these messages across to consumers? I, sure. I think that is a huge challenge for us um, to talk about and figure out. And this is something that on the SCA side we've talked about a lot. It's like what words are meaningful to consumers, what resonates mm. with them, what will actually yeah. get their attention. It, you know, what does fair trade even mean to consumers anymore? What does sustainability mean? What, is, what do any of those mean to people? Right. And does it have an impact anymore? When These are all essentially, they've all become kind of marketing buzzwords, right? Right. So like, how does the consumer mm-hmm. tell the difference between, well, it's like, well, Duncan says that there is, is you know, I, I just, gosh, what did I just see at Starbucks? Responsibly sourced was the word, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, everybody, yeah. consumers see these everywhere. So how, how do we make a difference? How do I think really picking a language that we think can resonate with consumers that we can agree upon is something that we should be on the lookout for. Cause I think that's one of the really big challenges. Cause ultimately in our own world, if, if we doesn't translate to consumers, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Right. No, it's you true. Know, like we can all keep this in our own conversation, but guess what? We're not buying to, you know, we're not buying and selling to each other. We have to we have to get it to a whole people, a whole consumer base out there. And if we're not, if we're not getting that message to them, if we're not getting them to buy into it, none of this matters. So I I think that's a really big part of it as well. Mm, So defining the terms for consumers is something that uh, shop businesses, roasters, and baristas can all do. Yeah. Something we had talked about with the coffee price crisis. And um, if you were at Rico this year, there was, we call her the banana lady who spoke at Rico. Mm -hmm. And what she had done that was so interesting is bananas have face a lot of the same issues of coffee when it comes to pricing. And so what the banana farm decided to do is they went out and they said, we are going to make sure that every farmer, every banana producer is getting a livable wage because it's livable wage is something that was very easy for people to resonate with on a, on a purchasing side, on a consuming side, everybody can say, yes, you should, of course you should be getting a livable wage, right? Like that's, that seems like common, common sense right there. And so that was really what they built things upon was livable wage. And that was the language that they decided to use. And that was really successful for them. So mm. we need to find what is that, what is that on coffee that we're going for? Yeah. Good stuff to think about. As far as resources go, what would you recommend for our listeners? Uh, I would say to start with, you know, make sure you follow the SCA. We've got webinars on the coffee price crisis. They just did one this week on them. We've also, you know, if you haven't listened to some of the RICO talks and some of the lectures that we've had, we put a lot of those online. So that's a really interesting place to start, I think. And it gives you kind of the baseline for the discussion that's happening within the specialty coffee community. So I would say start there for that piece. And my final question is sort of grabbing at the best advice that you've ever been given in your life. And if you don't have an idea of the best, maybe maybe something that is advice that you find yourself always returning to. So what is the best piece of advice you've ever received over the years and what has it taught you? Ooh. <laughs> so funny enough, it has nothing to do with coffee. Yeah, it's fine. It has to do more on the business side of things. And it's essentially if, and it's just, and it, it's, it's so something that's been really close to me the past couple of years and with the association, just lots of different work that I do and how we as Clatch continue to grow is that kind of leadership and management piece. And so for me, like one of the best pieces of advice that I've been given is it's like, you know, you're doing it right when you cannot go to work for two weeks and everything continues to run. Hmm. So that's something that for me has just been really important, especially recently, is making sure that I'm enabling people, giving them the right tools, empowering people, making sure that they have the right knowledge base, making sure that, you know, we've got that leading piece in place that they've, I work transferring knowledge that's something that for me has just become so important from like a business perspective and how we grow the business and take it to the next level kind of piece mm. is if I can step away for two weeks, then everything continues to run and operate we're on the right track. If I can't step away for, and this is something that we're working with all of our managers on right now, um, because a lot of our managers are struggling with that, like work-life balance. And so mm-hmm. it's like, okay, so what do we need <laughs> to teach the team? Right. Like if you can't step away from the shop for a day, we are clearly not training the team properly. So mm-hmm. I think, 
you know, this is the coming from me today because this has been really close to my heart, like the past year and something we've been working on a lot. And it's something I'm saying to my team all the time. Our management team is it's like, okay, so we're not there yet. Cause you got called yesterday. Why did we get called? How do we address that? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing something so close to your heart uh, with our listeners. Um, it's, we, we've received tons of feedback. People love to hear this part of the show too. It's, it's like a nice little gold nugget at the end for everybody. So, yeah. Well, Heather, thank you so much for joining us on the show, for for taking a shot at this really complex conversation. And um, yeah, just, just thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm thankful for this conversation with Heather. This talk has become another perspective for us to consider on our road to understanding the price crisis. When I set out to do this series, I knew it would be a challenge for me. I understood this topic as nuanced and greatly debated. I knew people tend to sidestep certain difficult elements of the conversation or try to offer some kind of silver bullet to solve it all. But something I did not anticipate was the overwhelming nature of the information. I feel beat down by it. And while considering that reality, I realized something profound. If I feel beat down and tired, how must the average consumer feel? And then further, I realized for me it's a luxury to feel beat down and have the option to move on and think about something else. You know who doesn't have that luxury? Coffee people who depend on the sea market for all or part of their livelihood. I want to challenge us all to consider how we share this responsibility as an industry and as people who enjoy drinking coffee. What solutions are you thinking of? I'd like to take a moment and share some thoughts from a recent listener. Quote, I think the last point in the most recent podcast is very interesting, that coffee shops are heading to offering both good quality, quick options, for example, batch brew, and specialized high-end options. As I've been engaging with roasters, I have definitely seen this as true. Roasters love our sustainable relationship-focused model for their high-end micro-lot needs, but it is significantly harder to convince them to use our model for their solid coffee needs. I think this is the best opportunity and challenge for specialty coffee. Roasters have very easy, cheap options available for them to buy solid coffee. I've seen so many roasters that promote their sustainable sourcing with specific producers they work with, but they clearly just buy their solid coffees with no transparency. Exporters buy coffees from producers and evaluate the quality and then offer the better coffees to importers at differentials and then pass on a very small amount, if any, of this extra profit back to the producers. This just isn't a sustainable, good way of sourcing these coffees. There will always be a large chunk of coffee that is traded as conventional. Many roasters buying high-end and micro-lots are doing this in an ethical way. If we can get more roasters buying the coffee in the middle in an ethical way, that could make a huge impact in producing countries. Just some thoughts, Sean. End quote. Thanks, Sean, for sharing your thoughts. What do you think about Sean's thoughts? I'd like to hear your thoughts on this or an episode previous to this. Email me at hello at the coffeepodcast.org. Join us next week for an episode sharing perspectives specific to Columbia. Music is by Michael Parallax. I'm Jesse Hartman. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, and until next time, happy brewing.